All right, so we're, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get started on our class, the final class of our study of Genesis. Welcome to class today. Um, very happy about the attendance for this class and seeing all y'all's faces every Sunday. And the makeup of the class is really great too. Um, I feel loud. Does it sound loud? Okay. Very happy about the makeup of the class too. I recognize that um, everybody in here isn't at the same um, stage in their journey and coming to know the Bible. They're not at the same, same stage in their journey to, um, to know God and in their same understanding of the Pentateuch or the book of Genesis, and that's what's made it really good. Some of you have studied it for a lifetime. Some of you are brand new to it this year. And so keep that in mind as we conclude the book of Genesis today as we're talking and hopefully we can pull some things out to kind of wrap up the thesis of the book of Genesis. Just from the outset, let me ask you, how would you summarize the thesis of the book of Genesis in this final class? What would you say? I have one mic passer. I don't know if we'll need two. But how would you summarize the thesis of the book of Genesis? God's redemption. Our redemption. God's redemptive path for us, okay? Brian? Very important, yeah. The promise given to Abram um, is, you know, the fulcrum upon which the book of Genesis sits. Okay, anything else? Okay, I actually want to revisit that to begin our class. Um, let's go back in our minds. You can look on the screens. You can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to talk about this promise. I want to revisit this idea that we were discussing in last class about the promise and providence of God. Okay. Now, I cheated because I knew I was going to ask that question. So I wrote down sort of a summary of what I perceive Genesis to be, and that is Genesis is a testament to the trustworthiness of God's promises and his divine power and providence to accomplish his will. It's a testament to the trustworthiness of God's promises, and his divine power and providence to accomplish his will. Okay? And you see that here, going back to the promise in chapter 12. Remember we talked about chapter 12 in Genesis as this hinge chapter. Um, prior to chapter 12, chapters 1 through 11, you have creation through the fall of man, the flood, the Tower of Babel, and then the introduction in chapter 12 to Abraham, who is going to be the first patriarch, um, the father of the nation of Israel. Okay, So here's his promise to him in chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay. So here's this promise to Abram very early in the book. To give him land, make him a great nation, and bring him blessings and bless us um, in return. Okay. So, talking about the promise and providence of God, last class we made a lot, a lot of application to our own lives. I felt I'd be remiss, though, just to leave the historical account of what's happening in Genesis altogether. We need to wrap up the story with Joseph and see the prequel into Exodus about how these events are coming to be. And so we kind of overlook this verse um, with Abram's promise quite often. You see how early that God prophesied about the events that were going to unfold in the Exodus story. Okay, In Genesis chapter 15, just two chapters, three chapters later from the verse we just read, it says, God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years, but I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your father's house in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So very early on, 
Right after the promise is given, God says this. This is a prophecy. He knows the events that are going to happen. And what's cool about it is, at this time, does Abraham even have any descendants? Does he have a single child? He doesn't. He says, your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. The events haven't even come close to unfolding as to how this is all going to coalesce and come together. Okay? Um, and it won't for centuries later. Okay. So let's talk about how this starts to come to be in this prequel to Exodus and how what God just prophesied comes to fruition. Let's just read together. We're going to read some of the scriptures, which we haven't done. Um, if someone can volunteer to read Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 11. We're just going to read the, what I would ref see as the resolution to kind of how God's people came to be where they were and the resolution of the Joseph narrative and that. Can someone read Genesis 45, 1 through 11? Go ahead, Michael. Thank you. So this, actually, if you're reading it chronologically in your own study, this is a very emotional scene here. This is the scene when Joseph, who's been separated from his brothers for over a decade, sees them again and sees them in a time of need. And at this moment, God's prophecy is fulfilled in his life. He sees his family and he sees the providence of God that has put him in this position that validates his trust and faith in him to carry out the promises that he made. And that's what gives him this eternal and spiritual perspective to say all the bad things that happened, God used it for good through me so that I could preserve a remnant. So you see the nation of Israel was, um, or the family of Israel was told to come down to Egypt. I'm going to skip the next passage for sake of time, and let's read Genesis chapter 47, 1 through 12. I'll read that one. 47, 1 through 12. Then Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they have have come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen, that is in Egypt. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants. Flocks for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. 
Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. <clears throat> Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many years have you lived? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my father lived during, during the days of the sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. And then to wrap it up, in 47, verse 27, just across the page, now Israel lived in the land of Egypt, in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. So, here we see God's providence prophesied to Abram back in chapter 12, some century and a half or a couple centuries before, that all of these events were going to come to fruition. And now we see um, how these events came, to back, came about with the promise from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and to the 12 sons. And then now it's no longer the 12 sons. We are now moving into uh, the nation of Israel. Okay, so let's just talk about that for a second. In Genesis chapter 46, 27, it numbers the people who came down to Egypt at 70. All the persons of house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. Um, in Genesis 47, 27, it says, Now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Exodus 1, 9. Now a new king rose over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. And then finally at the Exodus, Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. And so you see the providence of God to bless this family, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the twelve sons, and now they're going to transition. Right now we're in this prequel to the Exodus, but... The story doesn't stop and then have a hard start back in Exodus. It's a continuous story straight from the end of Genesis right into the first verse of Exodus. And so you transition from this na the, the sons of Jacob into this nation of Israel. And they were mighty, you know, so much so that Pharaoh noticed them and was felt intimidated by them. Okay, And so this promise to... From Abraham to this final verse here where they were fleeing Egypt, uh, uh, fleeing Egypt and the Exodus spans half a millennia, okay, some 500 years. And so we pose this question, and I guess I'll ask it again. Looking at the conclusion of Genesis and the prequel to the Exodus and God's um, promises and providence on display, how does that impact the way we navigate the challenges of our lives today? How might understanding God's promise and providence impact the way we navigate challenges in our lives today? Harry. Uh, at the beginning and also as, as we see them part as we go into Exodus, so is he as powerful over sins because he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. Took it right to the final conclusion, that's right. So in the same manner that these patriarchs were challenged and expected to trust in God, all men likewise should do the same, even today, to the spiritual promises of God. What else? Michael? Well, I'm reminded of um, just a message that rang loud and clear to me as we went through Genesis was that, uh, you know, you got to wait on God sometimes, you know, um, and, and, you know, 
he'll he'll do what he said he was going to do. Um, but you know, sometimes it might not look like it's going to happen, and and sometimes you might not even see it happen, as Hebrews says, right? Um, some died waiting in faith, um, but but ultimately, um, I guess the impact is is the trust and the peace and the um, assurance, you know. No, and and then therefore the the impact beyond that is is that I I need to remain faithful, I need to to, to live the right way. I need to live in a manner worthy of the of the gospel, worthy of Christ's sacrifice. I need to be holy as God is holy. I need to do what He says, um, or or these promises are void. You know, I, I will I will not enter in. Just as it was for them, right? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Dad, one final thought. First, I wish I had the verse citation, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And so we have to understand that God is sovereign over all, and he's a very active force in our life. And everything that we endure and persevere through in this life serves God's purpose for us. Be faithful, and, uh, and we'll receive the crown of life. Yeah, so a consistent theme here. Be faithful, why? Because we trust in God. His trustworthiness is proved out in the narrative of Genesis, and likewise, as Terry said, in our lives spiritually today. Um, you mentioned this, Michael, as well, just talking about the focus on the temporal versus the eternal. So that's what strikes me. Just reading the timeline of Genesis altogether um, um, from a macro view, the span from creation to the birth of Abram is some 2,000 years. Okay, you think about that. Jesus lived some 2,000 years before us, and it feels so ancient and long and far away. And here's Abram coming onto this earth and receiving this promise that was even foretold when Adam and Eve sinned, you know, the wounded victor prophecy, there's 2,000 years that pass before he comes to Abram and says, it's time. I'm calling you out of that land. You're going to go somewhere. Um, and then from there, it's centuries later that you even have a nation that's in Egypt, which he prophesied to Abram um, around that same time. So we're talking about 25 to 2,700 years, perhaps. Um, be graceful with, you know, my analysis of those years. It's not to the T some 2,500 years before the exodus even happens. And so this plan is coming to fruition in God's time. I think you said that, Michael. Um, be steadfast. Be patient. And so, and that's actually my first point. <clears throat> in Genesis, understanding the providence and promises of God in the context of how the patriarchs responded to God, in the context of how even in early times with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and all these stories, it grants his children proper perspective. So we talked about the time span of some 25 to 2,700 years from creation even to the Exodus. 2 Peter 3.8 says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Okay, so why is it so important for God's people to understand that? The context of that in light of our study of Genesis, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Michael, you kind of already said it. Terry, you want to add to Michael's? It's the nature of eternity. Uh, just by our own acquisitions we cannot understand eternity unless we read into God's word and it just says what it is 1,000 years is one day and one day is a thousand years just a little speck are we waiting on any promises from God <laughs> I would say so do many people say it's not coming I would say the vast majority of the world says it's not coming do many people use the fact that it hasn't come yet to prove that it's never going to happen? Absolutely. And so this is perspective here. We're studying these ancient texts that reveal this 2,500-year period. In fact, then we go, that's just to the Exodus. We haven't even gotten to the however many centuries before Christ and then 2,000 years to us. So we're just talking about this breadth of time, and yet God will accomplish what he says he will accomplish. And in the same way that Joseph went into enslavement, went off and served 
under Pharaoh, um, was falsely accused and imprisoned, and he maintained his faith, so should we, that in God's time he will accomplish what he says. So God's vision, this is a good one, ingrain this in your minds. If we're going to be people of the book who know the Jehovah God and his power and his um, omnipotence and omniscience, we must know that God's vision of the world and future events is crystal clear. Why is this important? Because do we not feel entrenched in all the things that are going on in the physical realm today and, and despair and wonder how we're going to be delivered from whatever injustices that are occurring in the world? Is that true? Absolutely. It is really hard to keep an eternal focus. Very hard. And that's the purpose of this study is to bring us back to that and reorient us. We are different. We are set apart. And the world thinks differently. Now, we'll go ahead and I'll read these verses. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you future and a hope. Um, Psalms 139.4, Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Hebrews 4.13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God has a perfect vision of the future. And so just like back then when he was talking to Abram and he says, hey, your descendants are going to be sojourners in a foreign land. They're going to be there 400 years, but I'm going to deliver them and they'll be fruitful. And then we read. And we will read in the coming weeks that it happens exactly as God said. And it maybe took a thousand years. It maybe took a couple hundred years, but it happened. Same thing today. What's going to happen with this country? What's going to happen in this world? And it's so broken. The notes I wrote down just for notes. Our focus today is no different. It's no less scary today to live. It's no less uncertain. It's no less volatile. It's no less worldly. And man's heart is no less set on evil. The lust of the flesh is no less prevalent. The lust of the eyes is no less prevalent. And the pride of life is no less prevalent. All of these things that plague us today plague these people. And yet we have faith and trust in God in this eternal perspective. Any comments on that? Preaching and he told him to build the ark. It took a long time. People didn't think it was going to happen, but it did happen. Yeah. Blood. Yeah, exactly. And as we, we'll get to a slide and we'll try to summarize very succinctly some of these stories. But yes, there's, there's example after example of God's grace and pleading for man to trust him. And then you can see some stories where man didn't. And then you see many stories where man did and the consequence. Okay. I think we read this last year about, or last week about being emboldened by this. Our faith should be strengthened. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. God's pleading with us to trust him. That's what I'm left with when I'm studying Genesis is that, okay, I feel my faith is strengthened reading these stories. I can trust in God. He's trustworthy. He's proven himself. And what he says he will do, he will do. I did write, just like as a sidebar caveat somewhere, that, you know, this idea of like the peace that comes in this physical realm from that doesn't have to render you catatonic and immobile or expressionless. God's going to take care of it all. Nothing matters. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be emotionally connected to the world and what's happening. The idea is that you have peace and you don't despair because you see the bigger picture and internal perspective. With people who don't have God and they have a holy temporal focus, they don't have that. And there is despair in that. And that's when you lay your head on your pillow at night and you're, you're, you're wrought with anxiety. It's because you don't have that eternal perspective. And so be emotional. How do the prophets respond to the declining state of Israel? In the Old Testament, were they, were they kind of passive about it? They were quite angry, and they were quite vocal, too. And they, they did a whole myriad of, uh, uh, of things to try to, to stop it and curtail anything that was happening. So I'm not prescribing that we have this eternal focus, and therefore anything happening in this country or world is, God's got it. There's an element of that. But, yeah, I get it. Okay.
but we can trust God, and the story after story in Genesis tells us that. So let's go back to the beginning quickly. You recall in Genesis 1, before the, world was, before the cosmos and the world was formed, it was described as disordered, it was darkness, and it was empty. And Genesis 1 shows us that he added order, he brought light, and he brought flourishing life, which culminated in the creation of man, and it was perfect. Man had a relationship with God, he had a purpose in the world, and everything was blessed. There was perfect order. Okay. And we're talking about this idea of trusting in God's providence. Humans had that choice from the very beginning. The idea was, was Adam and Eve in the very beginning going to trust in God's definition of good and evil and allow him to define it for them? Or were they going to reach out and define it for themselves? Do we trust in God to say, he can, his will, I submit to you, I will submit to your authority and what you say is good and what you say is evil? Or am I going to define it for myself, and that's exemplified in the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Okay, So Satan enters the story in Genesis chapter 3, and we read this passage. He says, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, the tree, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay. So man, God had already created man perfectly. The garden was perfect. He had given him a purpose. He said, everything in the world I've created is yours. He said, subdue the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Um, and man said, and he said, we're made in his image too, which is very important. So that's the tragic irony here is Eve reaches out to be wise in her own eyes, to be like God, to define good and evil for herself. But the tragic irony is what? You are already made in the image of God. You are already like him. If you submit to his will and, and, and submit to what he defines as good, um, you bear his image to all the world. And we know what bearing his image looks like now because we're reading this context in the context of um, Jesus, right? So you bear his image when you're loving and kind and merciful and graceful and, and, and peacemakers in this world. You're bearing God's image until we choose to define good and evil for ourselves. Okay, and so the relationship was broken because of man's decision, and you just see the spiral effect and consequence of sin. Many people today who don't believe in God, atheists, will um, make the argument that you know, how can they worship a God who allows evil to persist? How can they worship a God, um, in their eyes, who is unjust? Knowing the context of the creation and the fall of man's story, you see this beautiful story of a God who truly loves his creation and made it perfect and for a purpose. And you see man's choices as the reason everything spiraled out of control. Um, and you see that as we approach up into the flood. Um, turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, and we'll just do a reminder of that initial prophecy. Remember, we talked about one of the first acts of God when man sinned in the garden was an act of mercy, and this prof his prophetic words to Eve, or to the serpent. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he, that is her seed, shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. There will be a price to pay, but you will be defeated. Okay? So this prophecy that begins in the garden before they've even been expelled. Okay. So, how might understanding God's promise and providence impact the way we navigate challenges in our lives today? It forces us to trust Him, moment by moment. Even with this eternal perspective, the only choice we have is that at each moment of our lives, we trust in God and His providence. And God's children know his promises will be fulfilled. Michael, you said this. We can trust he's going to do what he says he does, right? 
And we see that over and over again. I think this next slide is it. Okay. So let's look at some examples. Um, Dan, you mentioned Noah. If you flip over to chapter 6, um, verse 13 and 14, God warns and promises. God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And what is Noah's response, Dan? Verse 22. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. He was faithful. Okay? He was warned. He was promised. This is coming. I'm going to do this. I assure you that I will. And I will preserve you. If you do the following, what does Noah do? He moves and does it. He obeys God. Okay? This point is repeated over again. How about with Abram? What's an example of his trusting and submitting to God's will? Okay, so Dan calls on uh, in chapter 12 when Abram is called out. He says, go to this land. You're going to leave your family, okay? And you're going to go to a different land. And what does Abram do? He obeys. He gets up and goes. What, what are some other examples from Abram's life? Okay. Uh, you want to expound on that one? So when God told him to take uh, Isaac and basically sacrifice him, you know, he trusted God. You know, he didn't know if God was going to raise him after he killed him, but he trusted God, and then God provided the um, lamb. The ram. ram. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the, the peak apex of Abram's faith, Abraham's faith, was his trust that God would provide a sacrifice, um, which is the same faith that we have, that God provided a sacrifice for us. Okay? That's actually the one I had, Dan, the calling of Abram. He was called forth, and Abram's response in 12.4 was he went. Okay? Isaac submits. Isaac is kind of left off. There's interesting commentary just on the life of Isaac generally because Isaac's life is told in the context initially of Abram's story, Abraham's story. And then the end of Isaac's life is just told in the context of Jacob's story. So that's how his life is. But that whole story about the trip up uh, to the mount to be offered as a sacrifice is exemplary of Isaac's faith as well and his submission because he went willingly. And there's that, you know, really sad and uh, sad verse where in, uh, it's 22.7. Isaac spoke, they've been journeying for three days. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire in the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. So there's a submission of Isaac to the saints, okay, his trust. What about um, Isaac, Jacob? What about Jacob's life? What's exemplary of his life and his submission to God's will? Jacob's a tough one. Y'all remember when uh, Jacob had the dream with the ladder and the stairs and the angels were going up and down. How did Jacob respond when he woke up from that dream? This is when Jacob was fleeing uh, his family because he's going to be killed by Esau. How does he respond to that dream? Let's read it. Chapter 28, verse 15. Let's go over there. Okay, so he has this dream as he's fleeing, and God says in verse 15, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Excuse me. Then jo Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob recognizes continually, although it's not explicitly um, portrayed in each chapter of his life, but he recognizes God and his power. 
And here it's certainly on display. And, and God was with Jacob as he sojourned with Laban's family and married his wives, and he was blessing him and making him fruitful. And from Jacob, we get the 12 sons, and then we have Joseph. Joseph is fresh. We've just done that one. Obviously, we see many examples of Joseph's life, of his submission. One would be, essentially, the one um, that is clearly my favorite, because I've mentioned it several times. But in chapter 50, which is the last chapter of Genesis, he reiterates something he already said back in 45. In 50, verse 20, verse 19, But Joseph said to them, this is at the very end, right before he dies, Do not be afraid, for am I, uh, but Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Uh, Verse 22, Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed in place in a coffin in Egypt. End of Genesis chapter 50, moving into Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. So Joseph dies, and how he leaves his life is with this eternal perspective. What? Saying what? God will surely do what? He's going to provide. Have faith. Probably pretty important words, given what's going to happen in the next half millennia, right? Um, It'd be good to have an eternal perspective here. Trust me, again, this promise is reiterated. God is going to take care of you. It's not going to look like it, though, right? And how many generations are going to die having never even seen the promise fulfilled? That's another good point. Die in captivity, perhaps yet God is going to control it in his time. Any comments on this, on these stories? All right. Let's talk about some spiritual parallels. All right, the first one I'll give out. We, too, are strangers in a foreign land. In in 15, verse 13, we mentioned how God says, hey, the nation of Israel is going to be sojourners in a foreign land. And um, this is likewise the case for us today, right? We are sojourners in a foreign land. God's people are sojourners in a land that is not theirs. Are we like the world? Do we do the same things as the world? No. We trust in God's providence. We trust in His promises And so, therefore, we are like aliens or strangers or or sojourners in a foreign land. Ephesians 2.19 says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. And so, in Jesus, we have a new family, okay? And we're no longer sojourners. That is our family in the nation uh, as children of God. What's another spiritual um, implication? Well, just even just God calling us to trust him. In each of these stories that we've mentioned, what does he say in Matthew chapter 11? Read Jesus' words there. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. This isn't a promise. This is an assurance. Come to me. Find refuge in me. I am your deliverer. So God calls us to trust him. Where else in maybe the New Testament does God call us to trust him?
um, well, many places. He, calls us to, he, he tells us about baptism and, and the salvation we have in baptism. Um, what does Mark 16, 16, 15, 16 say, Dad? Okay, this assurance of salvation, I will save you. What? Your eternal soul is preserved. Okay? Um, I am with you. You can, you can trust me. So God promises deliverance to his people, and we can trust him um, today. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved, Harrison, that's right. So with an eternal focus on God's promises and providence, we can have faith knowing that we've been delivered because of Jesus. Makes sense? Any closing comments? Um, I actually finished slightly early. Um, I'm really excited about the study of Exodus. Um, Jordan and John are very talented teachers, and I'm looking forward to going through that text with them. But um, any closing thoughts on the book of Genesis? Michael, then Terry. I just wanted to thank you and Doug for your preparation and for putting this together. I, th I think it's been a very fruitful class for me and hopefully probably for many others. I've enjoyed it. I've definitely enjoyed it. Sometimes it felt like a strain, but I, I just think that's because you have to get in like book report mindset, like reading and condensing. And, uh, you know, I will make one encouragement, Terry. I'll make your comment, Terry, and then I'll say it. Uh, yes, and it's, it's so sad that, and it's the, I don't know why, it's the hardest thing to sell to our friends in the denominational world that baptism does save. It, it's not a, a, as I say, a sign of, of faith. It, it saves. Uh, Paul, Paul, uh, Peter said it, and, and Acts, other people, we've all, we've all actually would uh, would would say it? Why is it so hard for our friends in in Christendom to associate that baptism is necessary for salvation? Yep, and and then trusting afterwards that it's done what it was said to do, right? Trusting in your salvation. So one of the encouragements, one of the things I've tried to do in the in studying this class. Something came across one of my social media feeds was with this uh, technique to learn and memorize. I forget what it was called. But anyway, it's actually not that profound, but it is profound if you do it. But the idea was to start writing out the story of whatever you're doing, whether you're studying finance or you're studying accounting or you're studying history or the Bible. Write it out. Start writing the story. And then see, go back and read it and see where you're stretching thin or trying to grasp for words to articulate the message, right? And then where you're stretching thin, circle that, go back and study and fill in those blanks, okay? And try to memorize and see where it is. And I would encourage you to do that with the Pentateuch and with Genesis. Start writing from creation on the story, you know? God created, he, he created order and brought light and flourishing life to this world that was disordered and chaotic. And he brought man and placed him in there, and it was perfect. And tell the story of the gospel from the beginning on. And where you're stretching for words, circle that, and then go back and fill it in. And then go back and rewrite it again. And what you'll see is you'll start to fill in those gaps and be able to sort of shoot from the hip and, and tell the story in your own words um, and, and know the flow of the narrative through, through Scripture. And so that's a helpful hint. As we go into Exodus, maybe... As we prepare for Exodus, write down what you know about Exodus. And it may be real, you know, bones, right? Because you're going off of your memory. Don't look it up. In the beginning of Exodus, we're introduced to Moses, and somewhere the nation, he's told the nation of Israel, and he kills a guy in there somewhere. And then uh, uh, the, the Exodus and the plagues or whatever. And then go back and add some depth and meat to it as we start studying with um, Jordan and John. All right. Thanks, guys. That's it. <laughs>